First John. That's me. First John. God's love and ours. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent this one and only, his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he showed us and sent his, his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he lives in us because he was given us of spirit, of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. That's our scripture. How about now? There we go. Okay. Barry reminded me of something when he said that uh, Merle and Polly were going to get married, and that's very unusual to see today in people that are getting older. Say that the right way. (laughs) Young at heart. Because so much now, if you understand, is you see people as they're getting more elderly um, divorcing because it's economically capable. And what is that telling our children and everything? So I do commend you guys. It's great to know you're going to do that. So this morning's message is about falling in love. And it should have a question mark, but that's cool because it's falling in love. So let's start out with prayer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today to freely worship you, to read your word and not just read over it And not take it to heart, Father. The things that you would have us to hear, the things that you would have us to apply, which is your word as a whole, Father, help us to do that. Help us to not skip over certain parts or not to take parts and apply them more to our lives than others, but to take your whole gospel message, your whole entire word, and apply it to our lives so that we can be more like Christ, so that we can be a light to a world that so desperately needs us. Bless this, your reading of your word today in this sermon, Father, and just help me to speak your words and apply them to our lives. Bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. So i got some advice for you because there's a holiday coming up Saturday. If you're not aware of it, guys, I thought I'd give you a free warning. Valentine's Day, okay? To prove his love for his wife, he swam the deepest river, he crossed the widest desert, and he climbed the highest mountain. But she divorced him anyway because he was never at home. (laughs) So remember that. So I thought about that and this morning I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to apply that. I'm going to listen to that. So Sherry was getting dressed and everything and she's, we're both in the bathroom. She's looking in the mirror and she says, (laughs) she says, I'm looking old and kind of weathered. 
say something positive to cheer me up, honey. And I said, well, your eyesight's pretty good, dear. <laughs> so what is love? Where do you find the answers? If you go by man's definition, and that's what we do so many times. And it's not always wrong, but you've got to remember that the ruler of this world is Satan. So a lot of times the definitions that we have and even honorable things are skewed so that we don't see God's true meaning of it. Man's definition of love is, and I took most of these from the uh, dictionary thing, definitions and put them all together. Love is an intense feeling. It's an emotional state or reaction of deep affection. Love is a feeling to feel a deep romantic or sexual attachment to someone. Love is strong affection, a moderate feeling or emotion, attachment for another arising out of kinship, personal ties, or something that makes them feel happy. Love is an attraction, something interesting or enjoyable that draws someone to someone else, a feeling that someone is romantically or sexually interested in another person, usually based on sexual desire. Love is a variety of different feelings, states, and attitudes. It's the way you think and feel about someone, a feeling that affects personal behavior, that involves a level of affection and sexual desire. I kind of put all those things together, but if you didn't catch it, you heard feeling over and over and over again. You brought sex into it also. Well, the problem with feelings are feelings change, don't they? So if you use man's definition you're probably going to go into a world of hurt when you start into a relationship. Love does involve feelings, but love is a choice rather than a feeling. So can you really fall in love? Maybe. But loving is a choice if you look at God's Word. If you can fall into love, what's the problem? You can fall out of love, right? Just as easily. And if you base the love on the other things that we read here, what I get out of this relationship, then you're setting yourself up for a world of hurt. Because if you read the biblical definition of love, it's not self-centered and self-pleasing. It's a lack of self, a love for others unselfishly. Man's definition might sound okay, but God's definition is much, much better. So today I want to look at falling in love. It's so easy, like I said, to fall out of love once those things stop flowing your direction. Because if we're I-centered rather than Christ-centered, once times get tough, once we're not getting the things that we need, we don't want to show that love back, do we? When someone offends us, or someone says something that we don't like, or our spouse is not doing the things that we want to do, even, even to the point of not cleaning the house the way that you think she should, if that's one of her duties. Or he, I said if it's one of her duties. I clearly said that. Then you think that, hey, what's wrong with this relationship? Well, the point is, is we should love regardless. It should not be tied to anything that we get. If that was the case, Jesus Christ would have never came to this earth, would have never died for us, and we would be hopelessly, desperately lost, punished for all eternity if that's the kind of love that God wants us to practice. The only source of, the, of truth is God's Word. And God's Word has definite definitions of love. So with Valentine's Day coming up, I suggest you search Scriptures. You see what the Word of God has to say about love. And don't not celebrate it, guys. I'm not saying not celebrate Valentine's Day. Don't say, the pastor said don't celebrate Valentine's Day. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying look at God's Word for the truth. Take time to celebrate your love. And you should be doing that every day of your life. So Valentine's Day might not be that significantly different. Valentine's Day, I looked up some definitions there. It's a time of celebration, of sending cards and gifts, showing your affection, love, and dedication to that someone special. But when I did research, I found out that I found just as much research, if not more, that it was a miserable holiday, a holiday that really pointed out loneliness and a holiday that pointed out uh, individualism. Because if you don't have anybody, what kind of holiday is Valentine's Day? 
Most people say it's a miserable day, a waste of time, a commercial trap, and more of single awareness day is what it should be titled rather than Valentine's Day. Loneliness is such a big attribute rather than love. What a shame this world is when we base our definitions on man's views rather than on God's views. Love should never, ever be viewed that way. Here's one definition I came across. This is a commercialized holiday that is designed to make you and your significant other fall in love even more or gives you the opportunity to tell your crush that you love them but really just ends up making 90% of the population depressed and lonely, pointing out that they do not have anyone or at least someone significant. Many buy, men buy the one that they love the same gifts that are overpriced that day versus any other day with no originality whatsoever when they should be showing their love to them daily. So guys, like I said, don't use me as not a reason to go buy candy or flowers. You do what you want to do, but you make sure that you tell your love that you do love them. But let's get in a practice of saying it every day. And that works the other way around, ladies, also. So, how do you know if you're in love with someone? Are your palms sweaty? Is your heart racing? Is your voice caught within your chest? That's not love. That's like. You can't keep your hands and eyes off of them. That's not love. That's lust. Do you want them because you are lost without them? That's not love. That's loneliness. Are you committed to them? That's not love. That's loyalty. Do you stay because you don't want to hurt them? That's not love. That's pity. Do you tell them every day that they are the only one that you think about? That's a lie. <laughs> we think about it, sing about it, and we lose sleep worrying about it. When we don't have it, we search for it. When we discover it, we don't know what to do with it. When we have it, we fear losing it. It is a constant source of pleasure and pain. But we can't predict uh, which it will be from one moment to the next. It is a short word, easy to spell, difficult to define, but impossible to live without. So what is love? And can we fall in love? If you look to the Scriptures, the primary meaning of love is purposeful commitment to a sacrificial action for another. It's not a feeling. It's an intentional and purposeful decision, a choice to love someone, to be committed, to continually sacrifice for the other person. In the Bible... Loving God is equated to obeying His words. Have you thought about that? The passage that we said this morning says that we don't even know God if we don't follow His commands. God is love. We can't understand love if we're not following God's commands, if we don't understand His intentions and His laws. We can't even know Him. The two are inseparable. If we look at the Scriptures we read this morning in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God and knows God, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. It's simple. If we want the truth, we go to the source, and that's God. He is love. If we look all through His Word, we see His unfailing, sacrificial love all the way through, regardless of anything we did. In fact, despite of anything that we did. Because we did the exact opposite of deserving any love. We deserve punishment instead of love. Thank goodness God is righteous, but thank goodness He's also merciful and loving. If you read on in verse 15 and 16, it says this, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, if you have recognized that, you call yourself a Christian, then God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. We rely on it. God is love. If you're a Christian, then you are called to love. You must love. It's not a suggestion. You are commanded to do so. And if you don't, the Scripture says you don't love God, plain and simple. You might think you do. You might have the head knowledge. You might have half-hearted knowledge. 
But if you don't love someone else, you're not loving God. You don't know God. They're inseparable. You cannot separate the two. Verse 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Why are we commanded to love then? Because the way God loved us, yes. And because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The whole Bible is the love story or love message from God to children that He created because He wanted to enjoy a relationship with them and fellowship with them. Once Jesus died sacrificially because of His love for us on the cross and was raised again, if we accept that, we have received His sacrificial, unselfish, unfailing, everlasting love. And we're supposed to do the same as His children. Because God loved us even while we were sinners, we are called to love others even though they're sinners. Looking at verse 9 in that passage, 9 through 11, it says this, This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and He sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since, because, however you want to say it, that God so loved us, so much He poured out His love on us, we ought to love one another. But don't be confused with the word ought. It doesn't mean that it's a suggestion. If you look up ought, it comes from the Greek word ophiliamon, which means o indebted, obliged, to rectify a debt, morally obligated to pay a legitimate debt, something that must be done. So again, if we look at man's definition, we might say, well, we ought to love our neighbor as a suggestion. No, we are required to, by God, because of the love that He gave to us, we are committed and indebted to give that same kind of sacrificial love. So I kind of paraphrase that verse. When you read it this way, it sounds a little different. Dear friends, I know that you profess to be Christians. And because God was so gracious in giving you undeserving and unmerited grace instead of the terrible punishment that words cannot even begin to describe, you must love one another. Not just with words, but love with the same perfect and sacrificial love that God gave you because you are indebted with your life for all of eternity to God for the love and grace that He so lavishly poured out on you when He brought, brought you back into His family with the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you look at the sacrificial love, the love that God has for His children, how can you not love back? If you truly understand God, if you are His child, you are called to love. If you back up in First John... You'll understand that 1 John was written to assure us of the hope that we have in salvation, the hope that we have in store. And it's a warning against how Satan and false teachers will try to deceive us, to distract us from the truth, so that we water down our definition of love. So that when we say, I love you, it really doesn't even have much merit or meaning anymore. If we go back to 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, beginning of the book, verses 1 through 7. The section is entitled, The Word of Life, and it reads like this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify it to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, Jesus. We write this to make your joy complete. And then it goes on to say, walking in the light. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all, none. If we claim to have fellowship with Him... Yet walk in darkness, we lie, and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 
And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Fellowship means community, joint participation, communion, and intimacy. Intimacy not only with God, but intimacy with His children, with one another. Since we have been reconciled through Jesus Christ. However, we cannot have that kind of relationship unless we walk in the light, unless we live by His commandments. We cannot have any darkness. And you say, well, I can't do that. I'm a sinner. You're right. So that means that you have to take yourself and give yourself up. Take the eye out of the equation. Lay everything down at the cross and be empowered by the Spirit that He gave you. When Jesus left this earth, He told His disciples, He said, you're going to go out unto all the nations, baptizing, telling people about Me, and making disciples thereof. But first... He sent them back to Jerusalem to do what? To wait till the Holy Spirit came upon them. I don't know about you, but what I think is they went back to go and say, wait a minute, why did He send us home? We need to be going out there and fighting this battle. We need to go be telling people about Jesus Christ. There are people dying in this world. Why did He send us home? To get a sobering fact in their heads. We cannot do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts and saves. The Holy Spirit is the one that empowers us. By searching God's Word and letting the Holy Spirit live through us, we can love our brother. But we have to get rid of our wants, needs, and desires and take on Jesus' desires. To serve the Father sacrificially to die for the, what, those that are lost and don't know Him. Those who walk in the light are in communion with Jesus, with God the Spirit, and with each other. How can we say that we're Christians if we continue to walk in darkness? Notice today that most people define love as a type of feeling. We fall in love because we get something out of it. We are attracted to someone, whether sexually, whether they say something to us that's nice, whatever reason it may be. It makes us feel good. Well, I don't know about you, but loving my wife, loving my child, loving my neighbor sometimes doesn't feel good. Because sometimes somebody said something that hurts me. But I need to love them regardless. Love is not easy. It's a choice. It's a choice we make. People don't understand that. That's why there are as many divorces. Half half the people that get married today wind up in a divorce. They say the commitment, but they don't understand. And if they do understand, they don't bow down and put their lives to Jesus Christ, to the cross, and let Him empower them. You can't do it on your own, guys. You have to be an empty vessel. And then you have to break that vessel so that Jesus' light can shine through you. The world's definition of love is based on getting something rather than sacrificially giving something. The more intense the feelings of love, the greater that love seems to be, right? But that love can quickly, depending on what the feelings are, if I'm getting something good out of the relationship or not, not only die, but turn to hatred. That's how easy Satan can deceive us. If you base your definition on feelings... Chances are your relationship won't make it. If you look at God's Word and follow His directions, though, and let Him give you strength, then not only will your chances be greater that you're going to make it, but look what a glorious thing He has in store for you. When He created man, He said, It is not good for man to be alone. And He created a perfect helpmate. He didn't create woman after the fall. He created woman when everything was still perfect. So I know that my mate is perfect in every way for me. That God created her to complete me, to be one. And I am so thankful for that. To know that God loves us enough that He didn't want us to walk through this life without having someone that would complete us. You've got to look to Him for the strength. Our example of true love is shown in one particular verse, I think, in Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrated His own love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. There's nothing we did. Everyone turned his back on Jesus. And yet He still did the Father's will. 
He died because of how He sacrificially loved us. True biblical love is a matter of choice, not of feelings or emotion. God chose to love you even while you were a sinner. It's not based on any merit. There's nothing that you can ever do that will make Him love you, but He loves you despite everything that you do do. That's the biblical definition of love, and that's how we're commanded to love. You're all familiar with 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love chapter of the Bible. And Paul gives us some specific things to follow. And he tells us in this that really the most important spiritual gift that you have is love. If you don't have love, the other is really irrelevant. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, it says this, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And then if you skip down to verse 13, he concludes with, he says, And now these three remains, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You read in the King James Version, it says charity instead of love. Charity is the exact opposite of selfishness and self-centeredness. It does not desire its own praise, its own motives, its own self-satisfaction or pleasure. Instead, it prefers the welfare of others over its own embitterment and well-being. The Greek word is agape. It is a, that is the noun form, which means affection, goodwill, love, benevolence, brotherly love that is from God and cannot be associated with evil desires. Agapeo is the verb tense. It is used to describe John, God's divine love. And in John 3.16 we see that. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. The definition means a total commitment to the well-being of others. So it doesn't only mean that you're to love your neighbor, especially your brother or sister in Christ, but it means that you're out for their well-being more than your own. That's taking the definition a step further, isn't it? So we're not only to love, but we're to worry about their needs over our own. So when we do get offended in everything, shame on us. There's no part of that in God's definition of love. We need to be sacrificially serving so that they can see the love of Jesus Christ. So they'll know that why Jesus came and died on, this cross, on the earth for us. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for the church. That's the kind of love that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to love even until death so that we care enough about others that they'll come to know Jesus Christ. There's nothing that an individual can do to obtain love. We have to make a choice to give love. So remember that in your marriages. Remember that in your relationships. Biblical love will help motivate others to serve, especially in the bonds of marriage, but also in relationships. No matter what circumstances or tribulations you face, love can pull you through it. Biblical love is a choice, not a feeling. But the choice is up to you. You have to be 100% committed to loving God before you're able to love others. Jesus was asked this. He was asked what the greatest commandment was. And He said, basically, you can sum it up in two things, and all of the law hangs upon these. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So I ask you, will you follow Jesus today? Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for that unselfish, sacrificial love that you gave. While we were still deep in our depravity, You chose to love us rather than to destroy us. You chose to give up your son's life to save us. I cannot describe 
how that makes me feel. A mighty, powerful God that would care to love a sinner like me. But I thank you for that, God. And I pray that as individuals, we will serve you with all of our heart. And I pray as a body of Christ, we will do the same so that we can make a greater impact on this world rather than being individuals, but as a united body, serving the Savior, the head, which is Christ. And we thank you and praise you for your mercy, your grace, your goodness, and the love that you poured upon us, Father. We thank you and give you praise today, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to do communion.